Hello. Today we are going to start with something new uh, as opposed to all the previous videos have been about free oscillations. Free oscillations are oscillations once you start them, once you start them, they never die out. So if you remember, whatever analysis we have done so far, I think in the last nine videos, all were related to free oscillations or undamped oscillations. That means if you have an oscillator, if you have an oscillator, you displace it, you leave it, it continues to perform this oscillation. It continues to perform these oscillations and it never stops. These oscillations never die out. Now, the moment you hear that there is something called as free oscillations, immediately your mind goes, no, nah, that doesn't happen in real life. We have almost never ever ever seen something that you start oscillating and it continues to oscillate without diminishing its amplitude. That never happens. So all the oscillations that we see around us, all the different kinds of oscillations that we might see have one particular feature. Once you excite them, slowly, slowly their amplitude starts decreasing. If you remember the amplitude in the, uh, the differential equation for free oscillations was m d 2 x y dt squared plus k x is equal to 0 and the amplitude was always constant. Not just the amplitude, if you remember the energy, I think the energy was half k a square. Half k a square. What is the meaning of half k a square? k is a constant, half is a constant, a amplitude does not change. So the energy of that oscillator did not change during the entire motion. So that means, see this, this oscillator is at rest right now. This oscillator is at rest. I give it some energy. I displace it and then I let it go. This energy never reduces means that it is continuously moving and this will continue to move for a long, long, long time. In fact, it will go on moving forever. That is what happens in free oscillations. But we know in any real system, for example, this is a real system. I start the oscillations and you see slowly, slowly, quite quickly, the amplitude is reducing and very soon it will come to come to an end. That means now the energy of this oscillator is not constant. Why is it not constant? Because it is losing energy. Why is this oscillator losing energy? Now things can lose energy in two ways. One is it can radiate energy just like the sun. Sun has a lot of energy but it is radiating. It is throwing out energy. Sun is constantly radiating energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Here there is no radiation of energy. So here the answer must be that the energy is spent in overcoming some opposition to the motion. That means there is going to be something that will oppose the motion. So if, if, if my oscillator is in, right now it is suspended in air. I have suspended this in air and air is a fluid. So air will exert a drag force or rather a viscous drag force because air is a fluid. Air has some viscosity. Air will oppose the motion and whatever energy I gave the oscillator. Initially I gave the energy, uh, I gave the oscillator some energy. Now the oscillator is going to spend that energy. It will spend or lose its energy in overcoming the air resistance. And this kind of energy is called energy dissipation. Dissipation means kharch karna. It is losing its energy. It is spending its energy in overcoming some kind of opposition. So basically the oscillations where when you place the oscillator in a medium, you place the oscillator in a medium and the medium is not allowing the oscillation, uh, not allowing the oscillator to move freely. It is giving some kind of resistance. These kind of oscillations are called damped oscillations. And then what will be the feature in damped oscillations? Damped oscillations, you will have amplitude, amplitude will go on decreasing. Amplitude will slowly, slowly go on decreasing. It has to. The amplitude has to decrease. And not just that, the energy as well, the energy of the oscillator, energy of the oscillator will also go on decrease. So this is what is going to physically happen when we talk about damped oscillations or we talk about damped oscillators. Why is this important? Why are we studying this? Before we start like going right into it and understanding the maths of it and so on and so forth, analyzing it, solving the differential equation. Before everything, why is this important? Simply because we are surrounded by damped oscillations much more than we see free oscillations. In fact, as I said before, there are no free oscillations in this world. I think that is not an overstatement. There are no free oscillations in this world. Whatever we see around us are damped oscillations. They, they are oscillators which are losing their energy. So this, this is more closer to our real life. This is more closer. And in fact, in this very chapter, I will tell you 
what is the link between what is the link between a shock absorber that we use in a vehicle a shock absorber and there is also something called a door dampener you might have seen a door dampener in many offices kai offices ke jo doors hote hain usme there is some kind of a dampener so that the door does not keep banging there is a door dampener what is the link between a shock absorber a door dampener and an electrical circuit and all this are related to damped oscillations how i'll tell you in the course of time so basically this is just to whet your appetite as to what are damped oscillations now we have to study this damped oscillations analytically analytically means analytically means mathematically we have to find its equation of motion so that we can predict what is going to happen see one of the most important things about physics is its predictive power about mechanics especially you should be able to predict given that you know some information about the system right now you should be able to predict what is happen what is going to happen after some time so we have to analyze the system mathematically so let us try and write down the differential equation for damped oscillations uh if you remember how did we derive this differential equation so we started by seeing we started by seeing all the forces acting on the system now we are talking about damped oscillations let us try and find out what are the forces what might be the forces acting on damped oscillations on damped oscillators there will be two forces first one first one has to be the restoring force if ever you talk about oscillations there has to be a restoring force involved kisi bhi oscillations mein there can be no oscillations unless and until there is a restoring force and we already know what is this restoring force proportional to this restoring force is proportional to its displacement from the mean position the restoring force is proportional to displacement from the mean position and it is directed towards the mean position that's why we had a minus sign that's why we had a minus sign so restoring force will also act on damped oscillators and remember this restoring force is a property this is a property of the oscillator this is something intrinsic to that oscillator you take a simple pendulum because the simple pendulum is tied to a string intrinsically it has a property of restoring force acting you take a spring a mass attached to a spring due to that system something inside that system makes it elastic and so there is a restoring force so this restoring force is a property of the oscillator but now i just said that damped oscillations it is going to experience some kind of resistance damped oscillations will always experience some kind of resistance if it experiences some kind of resistance then there should be a second force which is a resistive force and in fact i will write it this way i will write as an external resistive force external resistive force so this is a resistive force which is going to resist matlab it is going to impede it is going to oppose the motion and this is external this is the property of the medium this is property of medium or surroundings medium or surroundings and this has to be proportional to what do you think this restoring force will be proportional to now the answer is complicated the restoring force will be proportional to different things if it is immersed in a liquid in a fluid then it is dependent on viscosity if you have a spring mass system if you have some kind of a spring mass system on some surface then here the resistive force has to depend on friction but we cannot solve for all different kinds of resistive forces so what we do is we take one particular approximation and we say that the resistive force is this proportional to the velocity it is proportional to the velocity this is nothing but the velocity so resistive force resistive force is proportional to the velocity now is it always proportional to the velocity the answer is no actually it is only proportional to the velocity if it is moving through a viscous medium if it is moving through a viscous medium and the velocity is very small otherwise it can also be proportional to the square of the velocity the cube of the velocity and in fact if it is friction we know that friction does not depend on velocity at all why we are taking this case is this is easy to solve mathematically real life we have different kinds of resist resistive forces those we can solve using a computer we can just use a computer to solve them but in real life we are going to uh, sorry when it comes to solving it analytically analytically means solving it just by using mathematics and no machines 
So when we want to solve this by hand, we have to take this approximation that this resistive force is proportional to the velocity. Now, this is proportional to the velocity. How do you remember that resistive force is proportional to the velocity? Think of uh, uh, when there is rainfall, when there is some, some kind of rainfall and you are standing at a place, you feel that the rain is falling with some intensity. But when you start moving through, when you are on a vehicle, suddenly you feel that the rain's intensity has, has increased. जब आप बारिश में खड़े हो आपको लगता है बारिश एक स्पीड से गिर रही है पर आप बारिश में गाड़ी पर जाने लोगों तो आपको अचानक लगता है कि इसकी बारिश की गति और भी बढ़ गई है तो सडनली द रेन इज हिटिंग यू मोर इट इज नॉट दैट द इंटेंसिटी ऑफ द रेन हैज इंक्रीज व्हाट हैज इंक्रीज दिस यू आर कटिंग थ्रू इट एट अ ग्रेटर स्पीड सो बेसिकली जस्ट अ वे टू रिमेंबर दैट एक्सटर्नल रेजिस्टिव फोर्स विल बी प्रोपोर्शनल टू द वेलॉसिटी दैट इज अ वेरी सिंपल वे ऑफ रिमेंबरिंग नाउ we have this external resistive force proportional to the velocity and the restoring force now let's use newton's third law oh sorry let's use newton's second law newton's second law says that force should be equal to the net force should be equal to mass into acceleration that is mass into d2x by dt squared now what are the net forces acting first force is restoring force so this restoring force i'll write it right uh, here itself this force is equal to minus kx this force is equal to minus kx and this force this force is equal to minus of r into dx by dt here the proportionality constant is k which is called the restoring force per unit displacement now this r is the constant of resistance or damping coefficient this will this r is going to be the damping coefficient we will study this r in detail right now just assume it some kind of constant of proportionality it gives you the strength of damping how much is a system damping depends on r if r is greater that means damping is very much if r is less damping is very less for example air will have let's say air has a damping uh, coefficient of 1 water must have a damping coefficient of 100 because water is more viscous a very thick oil will have an even greater coefficient of damping but we'll come to r in a bit so f is equal to m d2x by dt squared this is my newton second newton second law now let us add all the forces first force is minus kx Second force is minus r dx by dt is equal to m d2x by dt square. By the way, why do we have a minus sign here? This minus sign represents that this resistive force is opposing the motion. This resistive force is always opposite to the motion. If the motion is to the left, resistive force is opposing it to the right. If the motion is to the right, resistive force is against it in the other direction. Now let us just rearrange and we get. the differential equation m d2x by dt square plus r dx by dt plus kx is equal to 0 m d2x by dt square plus r dx by dt plus kx is equal to 0 this is the differential equation this is the differential equation of damped oscillation very very important equation this is the differential equation of damped oscillation as i said before any equation that you write in physics you should know what is written and you should be able to find out information from that equation so what is this equation telling you the net force plus the damping force plus the restoring force should be equal to zero three forces i already told you in the first chapter if you remember first chapter mein maine aapko bataya tha physics mein you only add equal quantities not just physics in maths you always add equal quantities so when i am adding three quantities all three should be same if this is force this also is a force this also is a force okay then when you are adding three terms and getting zero imagine aap teen cheezon ko add kar rahe ho you are adding x plus y plus z and you are getting zero then what does that mean either all three are zero zero plus zero plus zero zero hota hai so either that is true but there is something else that is possible one or two might be negative एक या दो चीजें नेगेटिव होनी चाहिए इफ दिस इज
exponential function. Mostly, all differential equations are have exponential solutions. That means the answer will be of something from uh, the form of some constant into e raised to something. So let us start by assuming a solution. Let the solution see we are solving for x and x is a function of time. So this x, which is a function of time, we are assuming it to be some constant a into e raised to alpha t. Again, alpha is another constant, a is another constant, and t is of course time. That is what we are assuming. We are assuming that the solution is e raised to a into e raised to alpha t. We have assumed this. This is an assumption. If this is true, then this should satisfy this equation. So let us substitute this in the first equation. Okay. What what do we have? The first equation is m into d two x by d t squared. Take the double derivative of this. If you der double der uh, if you take the double derivative, you should get a into first derivative is a into e raised to alpha t multiplied by alpha. And again, if you take the second derivative, this is the first derivative. The second derivative has to be a into e raised to alpha t and this alpha is again a constant so it will become a alpha square e raised to alpha t that is the second derivative and the first derivative just substitute those values m into a alpha square e raised to alpha t sorry e raised to alpha t plus r into a into alpha e raised to alpha t plus k into instead of x i am just writing this a e raised to alpha t is equal to 0 Take something common that is common to all these terms. See, a is common, and this e raised to alpha t is common. So take that common, a into e raised to alpha t in bracket. I will have m alpha square plus r alpha plus k is equal to zero. Either this is equal to zero or this is this term should be equal to zero because you have some product of two things is equal to zero. Either this should be zero or this should be zero. This cannot be zero because that is your solution. Then it doesn't make any sense. So obviously this term has to be zero. This bracket entirely has to be zero. So m alpha square plus r into alpha plus k is equal to zero. This is what we have got. Now, what does this resemble? ये किस How is this looking? Is this looking familiar to something? This is a quadratic equation. Quadratic in alpha. See what are quadratic equations? A x square plus b x plus c is equal to zero. And what is the solution? By formula, it is minus b plus or minus b square minus four ac upon two a. So let us just use that here. So we will get alpha is equal to minus b that is minus r plus or minus square root of b square that is r square minus four m k. Upon two m minus r plus or minus r square minus four m k upon two m. That is the value of alpha. So you have two solutions. If I I can write this as alpha one is equal to minus r by two m plus square root of r square by four m square minus k by m r square by four m square minus k by m. What I have done is I have taken this two m as For as a denominator for this and as a denominator for this, because this was inside the square root, I square the whole term, so this becomes four m squared, and you get this. So basically, what I have done here is upon four m, sorry, upon two m. Now I want to take this inside the square root, so I will write square root of four m squared. Then take this, so this will become r squared upon four m squared. Minus 4m k upon 4m square. You cancel the terms and you get this term. So this is alpha one and alpha two. Alpha two will be minus r by 2m minus square root of r square by 4m square plus k by. M. Sorry, this remains minus. This becomes minus. the denom uh, the second term does not change. Only this sign is changing. Now you got two solutions. So there are two possible values of alpha. There are two possible values of alpha, and we know that differential equations which are second order have two solutions, and a linear combination of two solutions is also a solution. See, in differential equation, we use this many times. 
you should understand this is very important to understand that a second order differential equation has two solutions and the linear combination of both of them is also a solution the linear combination of two solutions is also a solution so what we will do is since we got two solutions we will say that the general solution general solution is a is a linear combination linear combination of the two solutions of the two solutions so first solution i am assuming as a1 e raised to alpha 1t and second solution this is the first one and second solution is a2 e raised to alpha 2t so finally your solution will become x of t sorry x of t is equal to a1 e raised to this entire thing is alpha 1 so e raised to minus r by minus r by 2m minus square root of r square by 4m square r square by 4m square minus k by m minus k by m e raised to alpha into t plus a2 e raised to minus r by 2m sorry this is plus this is minus r square by 4m square minus k by m into t so this will be your solution again this is not a very difficult equation not a very difficult derivation very easy think of simply think of the equation how did you get the equation use newton's law there are two forces acting the first force is resistive force proportional to the velocity second force is Restoring force proportional to the displacement, both are minus. Use Newton's third law and get this. That is a single step derivation. Assume a solution. Most differential equations, second order differential equations, the solution will have some, they will be proportional to e raised to alpha something, e raised to some exponential function. So we are assuming a solution. Let the solution be a into e raised to alpha t. a is some constant, we don't know. Alpha is some constant, we don't know. Differential, the solution to a second order differential equation should have two constants. Two constants are important. Now, take this assumption, substitute it in this equation, find the derivative and substitute the values. If you substitute the values, take something common, you get a quadratic equation. Solve that quadratic equation, you get the value of alpha. You get two values of alpha. So, let us assume two different solutions and then you get the general solution. Pretty easy. Please try and do this on your own. Try and do this one uh, on your own once and you should be true. Now, the thing is, how do we interpret this? So that we will study in the next video. So we will stop here.